Good morning. And welcome to worship in the name of our gracious Lord and Savior. Also welcome to those who are watching this service online. Today we begin a new series entitled One by One, where we think about God's love for each and every soul, for our souls too, and now we have the opportunity to share the saving love with others. May God bless this time that we spend today gathered around word and sacrament. We begin with hymn 245, Sing a New Song to the Lord. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. Listen. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, 
and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Jesus Christ, preserve your family of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid all that is wicked and harmful, and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first of our scripture readings for today's service is recorded in 2 Peter chapter 3. The Apostle Peter highlights the patience and the grace of God that he continues to allow our world to go on so that each one may come to know his truth and to be saved. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Here ends our first reading. Alleluia, alleluia. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. 
I invite you to stand for the reading of today's gospel, which is recorded in Luke chapter 15, starting at the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And you may be seated. Immediately after our hymn, there will be a short video presentation by a Pastor Rosano, who serves one of our congregation or one of our synods churches in the in the state of Florida. He gave a presentation about a year ago entitled One by One, where again he highlights the ways in which we can show concern to share the love of God with each soul. We sing together the hymn, Good News of God Above.
It's an understatement to say this is a privilege to share anything with you. To God be the glory for any and all things that he does through people like us. I was greeting people outside on the very first Sunday at St. Mark in Leesburg when Joanne walked up a small, thin, frail woman who looked like she must have had a severe stroke. I shook her hand and I said, are you a member? She said, I haven't been in a church for over 40 years. I said, this is great, because I don't even know if I'm coming back next week. And I said, why are you here? She said, my sister's visiting from out of town and she said she'd like to go to church. You're the closest one. It's okay with me. Her sister and brother-in-law walked up and I said, good morning. In the conversation, I asked if she was Lutheran. She said, I'm Methodist, but I don't care where I go. And I asked her husband, how about you? He said, I'm nothing. I said, you guys aren't going to believe this. This is my very first Sunday, and this morning I prayed, Lord, please bring me a Methodist and a nothing. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> After church, I asked Joanne, what do you think? Should we come back? She said, I think you should, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I don't have the courage to come by myself. I said, I'll be waiting outside for you, Joanne. I've got courage for both of us. I'll walk you in. She came. On a home visit, Joanne shared that she did not believe there is a heaven. When this life ends, everything else ends with it. And I also learned she had not had a stroke. Many years earlier, she was working in her office in New York late at night so that she could pick up her husband from the airport. He'd been overseas on business. Someone broke in and brutally assaulted her and left her for dead. They found her crumpled up under her desk the next morning and thought she was. She was in recovery for more than three years. Now she also had leukemia. Her husband, Richard, did not believe there was a God. If there was, where was he when Joanne was attacked? And where was he when their one-year-old grandson had a brain tumor? And I can tell you right now, he said, God did not write that Bible. Men wrote that. But I'm not going to think less of you if you want to believe he did. I said, I can't convince you that heaven is real. I can't convince you that God is God. But God can. This might sound crazy, but I'm going to ask you to please come and take a Bible information class that I'm starting. No obligations. You can walk away, but at least I'll know that I did everything I could. He said, thanks, Dave. We'll get back with you. I said, okay. And I sat and I almost got up to leave. And I said, you know what? I don't think I lose anything if I make you mad. But I don't think I just walked away from the coolest job in the world and took my family away from all their friends and family sat in a stuffy classroom for eight years to sit here in your living room and today become timid. What do you have to lose? I'm terrified that if I walk out, your wife, who I think you love, dies without peace. I also think that you love her enough to where she might keep looking for something after I leave because I think the Lord might have started something. And I'm terrified that somebody else would come along and schmooze you into a church. That's not going to be what you need. Please come. At the end of it, walk away. I'll never bother you again. They came. After class one day, Joanne said, I can't come. I can't hardly walk. I said, I'll finish at your house. One day walking into their house, Joanne was waiting for me and she said, Pastor, I get it. Just tears, but this huge smile. I know heaven is for real. And I'm going to be there because Jesus died to take away my sins. I said, you don't believe that for a minute. She said, yes, I do, damn it. 
grabbed a hold of my arms. She said, listen to me. I'm going to heaven because Jesus is my Savior. I just called all my children this morning and told them, and I told them they need to too because I want to see them there. And I told them I'm never taking God's name in vain again. From now on, I'm going to say, and then she said, the world's naughtiest word. I took her in my arms and I said, Joanne, I love you. We'll get to that in Lesson 17. <laughs> I looked over at Dick sitting in his chair in a corner and I gave him the look. And he just shook his head and I said, no. He said, yeah, Dave, I do too. I said, you both are full of it. We're still finishing class. <laughs> Few weeks later I came home late at night and my wife said you've been going nonstop since we've been here you can't keep going like this I said I know I'll try harder she said well can I ask at least how your day was I said I think I'm supposed to tell you that it was great but I just held Joanne's hand while the Lord took her home to heaven my wife cried No one can know how much is behind these words. Only the Lord and the two of us knew our former life. Only the two of us knew the eight years in between and all that happened in them. And the last thing I ever expected her to say was if it was all for Joanne, I'd do it again. to church because her sister was in town. And she ended up in heaven. Do you know any lost souls like Joanne? That's really the point of Jesus' parable in the lost chapter of the Bible. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables about something or someone that was lost. And that's the focus of our study today along with some of the thoughts from Pastor Rosenau's presentation. Take a look at the first verse of our reading. It's printed out in the worship folder. It's a, one of those verses you tend to just gloss over because it's giving you context, but I find it striking. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Why? Why would the tax collectors and the sinners gather around to hear Jesus? They knew that he claimed to be the Son of God and the promised Messiah. So what exactly were they expecting to hear? Wouldn't it be reasonable for them to expect the holy and almighty Son of God to tell them that they were living a terrible life and they better straighten up and walk on the narrow? And why would they want to hear that? That's what the Pharisees were expecting to hear. Remember, the Pharisees were a religious sect of the Jews, and they believed that the only way to get to heaven, the only way to earn favor from God, was to keep all of his laws. And they worked really hard at doing that. And in fact, they did it well. They were upstanding citizens and upstanding church members. But as a result, they wanted to know why Jesus welcomed those tax collectors and sinners, if indeed he was the Son of God and the promised Messiah as he claimed to be, why would he associate with such lowly people? The Pharisees were hoping to trap Jesus and get rid of him because they had rejected Jesus. They looked down upon him and they looked down upon those tax collectors and sinners too. Do you ever look down on others? It's pretty easy to do it. You watch the news and you hear about someone who molested a child or abused a woman or took advantage of the elderly and you might even think out loud, how could anyone do that? Which implies, well, I would never do that. 
It's easy to be filled with animosity and hatred and anger toward terrorists or foreign countries who threaten our freedom or the neighbor across the street who thinks differently than you do. And you, and you want, how can anybody think like that? I, I, it's really easy to look down upon those who have personally harmed us. What else do you expect from a woman whose husband left her for someone else or a child who, whose parent abandoned the family or a friend who was betrayed by another friend? But how does Jesus look at you? Of all the people, doesn't Jesus have the right? Isn't he the only one who has the right to look down upon us? He literally was sitting in his throne in heaven after he and his father had created the world. Peter mentioned that in our epistle reading. Simply by speaking his word, he created everything in the world and all of the people. And there they are watching Adam and Eve and listening to the devil tempt them and maybe thinking, don't do it, don't do it. And then they eat the forbidden fruit. They rebel against God. Jesus could easily have turned to his father and said, Father, why bother? Let's just crumple the whole thing up and throw it into hell in a handbasket. And, and, and then when Jesus came to earth, he, here are the Pharisees looking down on him. They kept God's law well, but Jesus is the only one to keep it perfectly. He easily could have shamed the Pharisees and even more of those tax collectors and sinners and even more Because Jesus knows that we are the ones who have sinned against him. We are the ones who have caused hurt and sadness and disappointment in the lives of others, even people we love. We are the ones who threaten his world and lead it into destruction. He could easily have looked down upon us, but he didn't. Instead, Jesus looked at us and our sin with sympathy. We heard that in last week's gospel lesson, right? When Jesus and his disciples went across the, the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and they saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In fact, Jesus had so much sympathy for us that he left his throne in heaven and he became one of us. He became human. And he faced the devil's temptations. And he dealt with all of the challenges of life in a sin-broken world. All the same things that we deal with. Even more. Jesus even allowed the very people that he had created to look down on him. Like the Pharisees. Or like his brothers and sisters or the, the people from his hometown of Nazareth who just couldn't get it through their minds that this little boy that they knew was also the Son of God. Or the church leaders or the Romans, they all looked down on Jesus. But even while he was here on earth, he, he humbled himself, the Bible says. Jesus didn't walk around like the high and the mighty or the rich and the powerful. He didn't expect everybody to bow down to him and to kiss his feet. No, that's not why he came. Jesus didn't come to prove that he was better than everybody else. Jesus came to save those who were harassed and helpless and who couldn't save themselves. In fact, Jesus humbled himself not just in life, but even to the point of death. Taking all of our sin upon himself, he hung on a cross and suffered the curse that we deserve. Now Jesus did that for everybody. In catechism class, you learn the fancy term. It's objective or universal justification. The idea that Jesus died to pay for the sins of the entire world, which includes the Pharisees who were good guys, and it includes the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and every single one of us. But there's another problem. Even though Jesus paid for the sins of the entire world, when we're born, we're still lost. Did you know that Jesus was talking about you in the parable of the lost sheep? We're lost because when we're born, we don't know who Jesus is. 
We don't know that he looks down upon us with sympathy rather than arrogance. We don't know that he humbled himself to live a perfect life or die on a cross or rise from the dead or promise that he would take away all of our sin and cover us in his righteousness and, and promise to take us to heaven where there is no sin. We don't know that. And so we're lost. The difference between the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the sinners is that the sinners realized they were lost. And that's why they gathered around to hear Jesus. The Pharisees had no need of Jesus because they didn't think they were lost. In fact, they're the 99 sheep. Jesus says, well, I'm going to leave those behind. And he's trying to help the Pharisees understand the reason he welcomes and associates and even eats with tax collectors and sinners is because they know they're lost and he came to find them. He came to find you too. Most of us don't remember being lost. We don't remember thinking like Joanne that there is no heaven or where is God when this tragedy or that tragedy strikes. If you don't remember being lost, give thanks to God. But know that you were. Some of you maybe do remember being lost or, or, or maybe you wandered away. and You know what it's like to be disconnected from Christ which can make you so much more thankful for the fact that not only did Jesus come to live and die and rise for you, but he came looking for you. He left the 99 behind and he came looking for you because every single soul is precious to God and that includes your soul. And only you know how he found you. Maybe it was Christian parents who brought you to baptism at such a young age that, that you don't remember being lost or or maybe it was a family member who invited you back to church after you wandered away, perhaps in your high school or college years. Maybe it was a pastor like Pastor Albrecht or Pastor Kovac or Pastor Schoen or Pastor Beck or Pastor Gieschen or Pastor Haneke. Some of you even maybe remember Pastor Cars who continued to preach God's word to you so that you wouldn't get lost. Whoever it was, Jesus was the one who was looking for you. And when he found you, just like in the parable, he picked you up and he put you on his shoulders and he promised to carry you. Did you hear how Pastor Rosenau went looking for Joanne? At first, she came to him. But if he had not welcomed her, and invited her back and offered her courage to come on her own, she would have never come back. And when he went to visit them and he found out that she didn't believe there was heaven because of what had happened to her and, and her husband didn't believe that there was a God because where was God when she was attacked or when their one-year-old grandson got a brain tumor and, and now she had leukemia, Pastor Rosenau gave credit where credit is due. He said, I can't convince you that heaven is real or that God is God, but God can. And he simply invited them to come and meet Jesus. He invited them to a Bible information class, which we'll be starting in about a month. We call ours New Life in Christ. That's just the book we use. But even then, he, he, Joanne's wife said, we'll let you know, Dave. And, and he was about to get up and go. Easily could have thought, well, I tried. But he wouldn't give up. Because I think he knew that if he got up and walked away, he'd probably still never see them again. And so he asked God and he found some courage. And he said, you know, I'm not here to make you mad, but I don't want to be afraid of that either. What he was afraid of, did you catch that? He was afraid that Joanne might die without peace. That even her husband wouldn't want that. So just come. And they came. And Jesus found another soul. I can't even imagine walking into Joanne's house and having her say, I get it. 
I know that Jesus is my Savior, and even though this leukemia is going to end my life on earth, I, I, I'm going to heaven. But nor can I imagine saying, well, no, you don't really believe it. Yes, I do, damn it! That, that's an interesting exchange. But what joy. And, and, and then to ask the husband, who months earlier didn't even believe there was a God. But Jesus picked them up, and he carried them on his shoulders, and he carried Joanne all the way home to heaven where Jesus says, he calls together the saints and the angels and they throw a party over every single sinner that repents because every soul is precious to God. And Peter reminded us the only reason the world continues to exist, the only reason this has it all been destroyed by fire is because God is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but every single one to come to repentance. Give thanks to God that Jesus found you and he's carrying you and one day he's going to kill carry you through the doors of heaven, and the angels are going to rejoice. But there are more. And I'm sure that you know someone who is still lost. Maybe they knew Jesus once, and they've just wandered away, and they just need somebody to tell them, it's okay to come back. We're, we'd be glad to have you. Or maybe it's someone who just never learned. They didn't have Christian parents. They don't know any pastors. But they know you. Are, are you willing to ask God for some courage so that you can just introduce one more lost soul to Jesus? It's not your job to convince them that heaven is real or that God is God. Just invite them to come and learn more about Jesus. Over the next five weeks, we're going to hear more of Pastor Rosenau's presentation. And I promise you, you don't want to miss it. It's excellent from beginning to end. And along the way, he's going to give us encouragement and also some suggestions. And we're going to talk about it in Bible study, different ways that we can reach out to people. But today, I'm simply asking you to think of one person that you know that is lost. And then today, will you go home and pray for them? And pray that Jesus would send someone, maybe you, to find them. Because you know that since Jesus found you, every soul is precious to God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God transcends our human understanding. May it guard your hearts and minds in true faith and to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join with me in declaring the Christian faith. Today we'll use the Nicene Creed. The words will be on the screen for you. We join together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated. And at this time, I will invite you to fill out one of our friendship registers. There is a book either in the middle 
and on the end of the pews. You can use one of those. You can go online to stpaulsfamily.com slash register. First, we ask that you would simply write down the names of everyone who is worshiping, including those of you who are worshiping online with us. And if you are our guest, we also invite you to give us contact information if we can serve you any further. And then if you are a member of St. Paul's or another Wisconsin Synod Church and you will commune with us, then you can just put the first names again on the bottom right hand uh, in the books or in the appropriate um, box online. Thank you. I invite you to stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the holy and almighty Son of God. You only had the right to look down upon us sinners, but you did not look down upon us. Instead, you looked upon us in sympathy, full of compassion and love, you came from heaven to earth to become one of us. You faced the temptations of Satan and the troubles caused by sin. Even after you perfectly obeyed your Father in every way, you took your sin upon yourself. You suffered our curse upon the cross. You earned our eternal salvation. Then, as our good shepherd, you came looking for us, your lost sheep. You found each of us. You picked us up and carried us upon your shoulders. You promised to carry us home to heaven, where there will be rejoicing over every soul found by you. Now you send us to look for lost souls. So many in our world, many that we know and love, do not know you. They are lost and in danger of being lost eternally. Send us out to find them. Give us the courage and the opportunity to show them your love and compassion. Every soul is precious to you. Help us to find one more lost soul. Lord of marriage, we also join Lawrence and Miriam Krieger, thanking you for 63 years of blessings on their marriage. Continue to teach them to love one another as you have loved us. Bless their hearts and their home many more years. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, And you may be seated as we continue our liturgy in preparation for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And we pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good morning once again to all of you, and a special welcome to guests who have worshipped together with us today. We're thankful to have you here with us and certainly do invite you to worship again with us soon. Call attention to a few of the announcements that are in the worship folder for today. Uh, this coming Tuesday, our National Night Out, where we give thanks and honor those who serve in law enforcement and fire protection. Most of the activities will be in the, the parking lot outside on Tuesday night. There are cards if you would like to invite someone to attend that together with you. Also on the first weekend of each month, we have a door collection for our Christian Care Fund that helps out those who are in financial need in our congregation or in the community. We do have some little referral cards that if you know of someone who has a need for that, you can fill that out and share that with us at any time. There's a steak fry for the men in the congregation and guests uh, coming up. There's information about that. New copies of the August newsletter are available on the tables as you leave the church today. We do invite you to our Bible studies, which take place after the service today, between services, and also on Thursday mornings at 9.30. And please take home a bulletin with you. You'll have the scripture readings for the week, as well as the other announcements that are there. Thank you for coming to the service today. May the Lord bless you in this week to come, and we invite you to take a few moments to greet those who are seated around you. God be with you.
Okay, Morris. 